and welcome to the show. Now, if you're watching this, the likelihood is you'll be a bit of a heretic if you're anything like me, uh, which means that the book we're looking at this week uh, will be right up your alley. Um, it is A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. It is written by Brendan O'Neill, uh, who is author, uh, writes for everything from the Daily Mail, uh, many, many papers, appeared on Australian television, British TV very regularly. Also been on this show a number of times, but not for a very long time. So um, I'm delighted that he's with us now. Um, Brendan, uh, great to see you. Um, and congratulations on the book. Um, I'm fascinated by it actually because, you know, you go through these various different topics, which we discuss a lot on this channel. You know, we, we've got the climate, uh, so-called climate crisis. We've got um, obviously trans issue. We've got kind of self-hatred, uh, white self-hatred, Western self-hatred, all in the book. But I just wanted to sort of start off with something you say, which is that in fact, the way we describe what we're living through at the moment is not adequate. I think that really sort of basically leapt out of me. What most people would call cancel culture, uh, you're saying that this isn't really adequate to, to, to actually cover what really is happening. Yeah, so that's in the introduction to the book. So that's yeah. really the first point I make, which is basically that the term cancel culture isn't good enough to describe what we're living through. And I say it would be similar to referring to, to if we refer to Salem as accountability culture yeah. or, you know, uh, the Inquisition as information management. It doesn't quite sit with me comfortably yeah. in terms of having uh, capturing the gravity of the moment that we're currently experiencing. I mean, I use the term cancel culture. It's a very convenient term. Importantly, it's understood by lots of people, members of the public, politicians, journalists. So it's a handy phrase. I'm not saying we shouldn't use it, but I think it's become a bit too um, small to describe what we're going through. And what I argue in the book is that the problem we have today is not just the occasional cancellation of a controversial speaker or the attempted cancellation of JK Rowling uh, or, or the, the cancellation of university speakers, whatever else it might be. As terrible as those things are, there's a broader culture of intolerance, authoritarianism and anti-enlightenment. There's a revolt against the gains and the knowledge and the progress of Western society itself. I think we're living through an extraordinary moment of counter enlightenment and one which is destroying freedom and destroying some of the great ideas of the past. So cancel culture isn't quite enough, I think, to describe mm. that kind of at that kind of climate. No, I, I, I would absolutely agree with you there. It's not dissimilar to woke, you know, using the term yeah. woke. Uh, I mean, it, you know, you, you, you talk about this as being, as you say, an attack on the enlightenment. Um, or as you or enlightenment um but also an attack maybe on on western culture or well which is broadly the same thing we're talking about um similarly with woke it just doesn't it's too well first of all people don't understand quite what it means um but it is a much wider thing um you talk throughout the book which i found you know fascinating it covers so many areas you talk about throughout the book um, about the importance, though, of language and words. Um, and I, th I was, towards the end of the book, I was very struck by something which I want to ask you about now, which was that you say that essentially um, people who are against the council culture, they tend to sort of play down the importance of words. They sort of say, it's, oh, it's just words, you know. And you're saying, well, actually, we're taking the wrong approach. Can you explain a bit what you mean by that? Yeah, so that's the final chapter of the book, which has caused a bit of controversy among some people who've yeah. who've been reading it. Uh, um, that chapter is called Words Wound. And my argument in that chapter is that words do wound. You know, there is a tendency among those of us who support freedom of speech. I'm pretty much a free speech absolutist. I think it's the most important value in a democratic society. Um, I oppose all forms of censorship. And there is a tendency among people on my side to say, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, mm. but words will never hurt me. And that's 
just not true. Words do hurt people. And I think we have to acknowledge that and recognize that. Not in order that we will then censor words because we don't want to hurt people, but just to recognize the extraordinary power that words have. You know, every great revolution in history started with words, started with ideas. All the great leaps forward in the Enlightenment, which were very disorientating for society, very disorientating for communities that were more traditionally inclined, they all started with words. Uh, if you look at the Reformation, one of uh, in that chapter on, on words wound, I talk about William Tyndale and his efforts to translate the Bible into English in the early 1500s. It was absolutely forbidden to translate the Bible into English. It was only available in Latin because it was assumed that only well-educated Latin-speaking priests would have access to the Bible mm -hmm. and the plebs, the, the sheep who would sit in the church and would their only job was to take on board what the priest said to them. And William Tyndale said, no, I think everyone should be able to read the Bible. It was one of the most revolutionary ideas in history. And it's no exaggeration to say that without his struggle to translate the Bible, we wouldn't have seen the development of the idea of freedom yeah. of conscience, yeah. freedom of speech, and the rights of ordinary people to understand things for themselves. And of course, for doing that, he was an outlaw. He was eventually found by the ecclesiastical authorities. He was strangled to death, and then he was burnt at the stake and reduced to a, a pile of ashes. That was his punishment for daring to translate the Bible. Um, and the point I make is that his words, his English language Bible, were quite hurtful. They were hurtful mm. to the e ecclesiastical order. They would have felt quite wounding to lots of people who existed in the early 1500s. They probably yeah. would have felt just as wounding as a, a, a Germaine Greer article does to trans activists today mm. when she refers to uh, trans women as big knuckle, hairy knuckled men in dresses. Mm. That, that makes people feel hurt and wounded. So the point I make in that chapter is we have to recognize the power of words, and that is the basis on which we should defend freedom of speech. It is precisely because words have this extraordinary power to change minds, change societies, mm. make things better, drag us forward to better understanding of the world we live in. It's precisely that power of words, their disorientating impact they sometimes have, that we should defend them from all forms of uh, censorship. Do you think it's that when people do just simply say sticks and stones may break my bones, you know, names will never hurt me. Do you think it's also because they don't quite understand the seriousness of the situation? It could well be. I mean, I know I know I fully know why they say that. I'm sure mm. I've said it myself many times over mm. the past few uh, years and decades of uh, the kind of in creeping culture of censorship. I know why they say it, that they're making a distinction between violence and words. And I do think it's important to maintain that distinction. So when I say words are powerful and words can be hurtful and words can change things in a radical way, I'm not equating them with violence at all. And it is important to maintain that distinction between words and physical acts, violent acts. Mm. And I think one of the dangerous ideas of our time, in fact, is the idea that words don't only hurt you and make you feel bad or challenge your ideas or, or you know, make you or, or offend you. We all feel <coughs> offended by things all the time. But there's this idea from the, from the cancel culture mob that words are the same as violence. So trans activists, for example, will say that uh, gender critical speech is an act of violence. It, it, it threatens to erase them. Um, Islamists, uh, Islamist activists will often say that criticism of Muhammad or mockery of the of the Quran is a form of violence against their spiritual beliefs. It's a it's a it's an abomination against God. And the danger in that argument is that if we treat words as violence, we encourage people to use violence in response to words. Mm -hmm. Because if we encourage people to believe that a word is an act of violence, then they will say, OK, I will meet those words with my yeah. own form of violence. That's what we see saw in the massacre at Charlie Hebdo in 2015. I think that's what we see in other instances as well, that when you see these kind of violent mobs that try to prevent gender critical women from speaking, all those people believe that they've been violently assaulted by speech and therefore they return uh, with their own kind of violence. So it's important yep. to maintain that distinction. But at the same time, we shouldn't get ourselves into a situation where we are downplaying the importance of speech and the power of speech. And the thing that does concern me about some friends of mine on the pro-free speech side 
is that we end up actually saying words are just words. You know, they're meaningless. Mm. It's Mm. water off a duck's Mm. back. And I think actually we should say, listen, the reason we defend freedom of speech is because speech is such a powerful tool for understanding the world and potentially changing it. And I think it's on that basis that we should make the argument. Do you think actually, one thing that struck me, you know, Brendan, is that we used to hear in this country, I'm speaking to you in Ireland at the moment, aren't you? Uh, But we used to hear uh, a lot in this country, oh, this phrase, it's a free country. You know, it used to just be just one of those things said quite casually. You never hear it anymore. I mean, do you think there still is free speech in this country? Um, I don't think there is. And um, this can be a difficult argument to make sometimes because I'm speaking to you. We could pretty much say anything we want as long as we don't say anything that falls outside of the law, which in itself is Mm. problematic. Some of these laws are problematic. Um, I think many people feel they have freedom of speech, but my argument is that if any form of speech is censored, then we don't have freedom of speech. What we have is licensed speech. What we have is a system where you're free to speak so long as you don't say anything that the authorities or the moral majority, or rather the moral minority these days, um, so long as you don't say anything that offends them or upsets them. So that is just, that means you have a license to speak so long as you stay within certain parameters. And and that means that we don't have freedom of speech across the board. A country with free, and people say to me, how can you have complete freedom of speech? Such a country could never survive, it would be mayhem. And I just say, well, look at the United States. They have a constitutional provision for freedom of speech. The state is forbidden from restricting freedom of the press and freedom of speech. Of course, they've never, they haven't always lived up to that standard, but it is a country built on Mm. the idea that speech should never be threatened by officialdom. Mm. Um, And I think that's something we should aspire to as well. I think in order to have full freedom of speech, the gender critical feminist needs to be as free to express herself as you know the boring guardianista with pro Keir Starmer views is free to express themselves Mm. if we only have a situation where safe um comfortable middle of the road views can be expressed but edgy and supposedly controversial views can't be expressed certainly not without an extraordinary reaction or the police knocking on your door then um that's not freedom of speech that is um then you're 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 allowed to speak so long as you say things that the state agrees with yeah in fact, the, the position, the constitutional position in America, you mentioned, might be one of the reasons why they don't have the extent of or any f- hate speech laws in the way that we do. Yeah. I mean, you know, this has been something which is intensifying and things that seemed to be a joke a while ago, for example, about misogyny, for example, being a hate crime is now very much in the ether, isn't it? It's, it's very much there. You can see where the drift of these things are going. Um, you say in your in the book as well, though, uh, and again, this is when you, you're coming to the end of it, um, that basically heresy always finds a way. Um, I people who feel the way maybe that we do about the situation find a way. How do you see that playing out in the future? How will, what will our way be? Yeah, that's a good question. I think. Um... I would make two points about heresy. Firstly, I would say that, um, you know, heresy is a scary word to some people. They think Mm. of, you know, heretics in the 1500s or whatever, saying crazy things and being dragged to the stake and burnt alive. You know, it conjures up those kinds of images. But I do think it's worth reminding ourselves that virtually every freedom and comfort we enjoy is a consequence of heresy. Mm. It's a consequence of someone daring to say something that they weren't supposed to say. So that goes right back to William Tyndale and his English language Bible. The reason you have, the reason you can go into a shop now and buy a pocket Bible in your own language is because he invented the pocket Bible in the English language and he was murdered for doing so. If he hadn't done that, we wouldn't be able to enjoy that freedom today or certainly it would have come much later. Um, or if you think about the heretics who said that the earth is not the center of the universe, that was an yeah. awful thing to say. It was unspeakable. Mm. It was as bad as these days saying that trans women are men. You know, it was the, it was the thing that shouldn't be spoken in public. Yes. Yes. And yet the fact that they did that helped to expand our understanding of the universe and our understanding of science. Or, you know, right through to the modern era, uh, you know, in the, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, the people who said, you know what, I think women should have the right to vote. 
they would have been looked upon as yeah. hysterics and yeah. idiots yeah. and in fact that's how they were referred to off very often or people in the early to mid 20th century who said i think men should be able to have relationships with that with other men without being dragged off to prison that was a yeah. dangerous thing to say you you seriously yeah. risked being ousted from polite society if you uttered those kinds of um social profanities but people did say them they did make the case they did stick by their guns they did suffer as a consequence whether with torture and death 300 400 years ago or with social ostracism in more recent times and the fact that they did that allowed um the overton window to open a bit more and allowed freedom to be expanded and allowed social progress to develop so it it irritates me when i see youngish people in particular on university campuses mm. fuming against freedom of speech mocking freedom of speech <laughs> saying that contrarianism or heresy and all those things is is just the luxury of rich white men which is a complete fallacy and we don't really need freedom and i think to myself listen the reason you people have such wonderful lovely knowledgeable lives full of freedom full of choice is because people put their necks on the block literally mm. Mm. uh for for those freedoms and i think it's really important to understand that and that might actually be the starting point to the second part of your question which is how we um push for heresy today how we make the case for freer more experimental ways of thinking and talking and and having open discussion i think it's important firstly to remind ourselves that it's only by doing that that we live in relatively modern free societies and also it's only by doing that now more and more that we can hope to expand freedom even further expand choice further and make life even more comfortable the more that we restrict freedom john stuart mill makes this point in on liberty the more we restrict freedom, the more we restrict the possibility of coming up with new ideas and new ways of organizing things. And that's got to be the starting point of the argument for heresy and free speech. It's it's only through those things that we can hope to have a greater understanding of our world. But I mean, I wonder whether you're worried in a way that I am. You mentioned universities. I know that, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, you've been deplatformed on a number of occasions, haven't you? Uh, in the past. And indeed, you did a report, did you not, Brendan, about free speech actually in universities some time ago. But um, what worries me is that apparently, if you believe surveys, young people actually don't really care, actually, pretty much about free speech. That to me is the the biggest threat. They don't, they really do think that offence, for example, does trump any notion of free expression, free speech. Um, and they don't just say, what's the problem? So what? You know, I mean, that is a real mountain, isn't it? That's going to be a real mountain to climb to get over that. Oh, absolutely. No question about it. And I think um, I, I, I always feel slightly torn on this issue. So you're right. I, I've been no platformed a few times. Um, I was banned from speaking at Oxford in 2014, I think. Uh, me and Timothy Stanley from the Daily Telegraph were supposed to have a debate about abortion and... The students said it's not right for two men to discuss abortion so they threatened to invade the event and then christchurch college mm -hmm. in oxford agreed to call it off and i wrote a piece at the time for the spectator i did a cover story for them called the stepford students which was about this mm -hmm. kind of trend among students to be these rather robotic conformist individuals who um wanted to shut down everything that made them feel bad or made them feel offended and um I think one of the issues is that it, there can be this temptation to blame it on young people. You know, the blue haired mob, the 20 year olds, the 21 year olds, they're, they're naive, they're wet behind the ears. They're often from the upper middle classes, I have to say. Mm -hmm. The same problems are not so apparent in red brick universities or former polytechnics. They're much more pronounced at the um, top universities, yeah. Oxford and Cambridge, Durham, yeah. places like that, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it's because one of the problems though if we expand it beyond the issue of young people themselves i think it's the problem is the culture that they tend to be educated in and socialized in so these are young people who are far more molly coddled than we were when we were young these are young people who are told that um if they get if they lose a friend in the playground or get get into an argument that's bullying it's terrible they have to report it to the teachers and have it resolved by pair uh, adults they don't go out as often as we did they don't get into scrapes they don't fall over and they are protected from the vagaries of everyday life by um, parents adults 
parents and teachers who think mm. that they are frail, fragile creatures. And I think mm. that that gives rise to a culture in which they it gives ri rise to the safe space mentality. And yeah. you actually see safe spaces on campuses now where mm. students will go into a safe space with um, coloring books and sometimes little little dogs that they can pet on the head and um, bean bags that they can sit in. And this is their safe space where they can hide away from such demonic figures as Kathleen Stock, you know, the most mm. moderate, um, uh, one of the brightest philosophers around who's treated as this kind of satanic figure who will ruin their self-esteem. So um, it's tempting to blame the young. I certainly have derived much pleasure from uh, uh, making fun of these young censors who are often very ridiculous. But it is, I think, worth looking at the broader culture and the question of what we as adults did or didn't do, which created this new generation of rather intolerant activists. Well, yes, I mean, one could say <clears throat> child centric learning, you know, one could, you know, the way in which parents now just see their kids as kind of this immaculate creation that can't be challenged in any way. Um, there's a, a chapter in the book, by the way, called Her Penis, um, which in some ways is, is wonderful the way that you describe, because that is a kind of heresy at the moment to actually say that it's impossible to say this. It's impossible. It doesn't make sense. It goes against common sense and biology. Um, so that has actually become a heresy, actually, to to point that out, I suppose. But what struck me about it, really, Brendan, was that you talk about the trans activists and, and you know and their 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 point on this, but they seem to be completely aided and abetted by journalists and broadcasters or whatever who continue to use that term, you know, almost in defiance. I mean, what's going on there? Do you say? I mean, why why should you know newspapers, local newspapers? You 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 point many of these examples out, you know, actually use this term often about a rapist or whatever. Her, you know, her her penis. Um, why is there such acceptance? Is this just down to fear? Yeah, it really is extraordinary. I think in many ways that's that's the big question. Why is why has it been embraced by so many people in the media, in politics, in the judiciary? I point out in that chapter that you, even in a, in a court of law, even police forces around the UK will now record offences as having been committed by a woman if the man who committed them identifies as a woman. And some police forces even do that for rape. They will even record a rape as having been committed by a woman if the man says he's a woman, which is just delusional. It's it's absolutely mm -hmm. hysterical. Mm -hmm. That's not how a civilised society should organise itself. We've got to appreciate the importance of truth and objective truth rather than constantly caving into people's um, subjective delusions about themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think um, the reason I wrote that first chapter called Her Penis is because, yeah, so you'll you'll see news reports in which it will say uh, a, ma a, a woman flashed her penis or a woman in, went into a, changing, a, a spa changing room in Los Angeles, which happened and showed her penis to other people. And you just think, what are they talking about? These are yeah, obviously yeah. not women, these are men. And that, I think, really cuts to the Orwellian nature of the era that we live in, because, of course, Winston Smith's job in 1984 in the Ministry of Truth was to rewrite old newspaper articles in order to make them accord with the ideology of the party. And we're seeing that now in real life. You know, the New York yeah, Times and the yeah. BBC, they both ran a piece uh, last year saying that an 83-year-old woman murdered a woman in her 60s and decapitated her. And I was reading this thinking, hold on, 83-year-old women mm. don't do this. 83-year-old yes, yeah. women tend to be quite small and, and frail and certainly not murderous. I can't think of any instance in my lifetime when an 83-year-old woman has done that. And you read it and you get to the last sentence and it says, uh, this 83-year-old woman identifies as a woman. So in other words, it's a man. So the whole mm. news report on the BBC and the New York Times was a lie. They yes. sacrificed truth for at the altar of ideology. And when we live in a society in which the press and politicians and the cultural elites think that they have the right to define reality itself uh, in defiance of the things that we can see with our own eyes, in defiance of the light of our own reason, they think they can say what is reality. 
that is the purest form of tyranny in some ways when they think they can redefine the world as it exists so that it accords better with their eccentric ideological beliefs and it's so important to push back against that and to if you ever hear the phrase her penis it's so important to say no you mean his penis that's the yeah, only acceptable yeah. thing to say in this situation uh it is alice in wonderland um no, no question mm. um finally uh brandon you make a very interesting point in the book as well when you say that <clears throat> also that this is a kind of in attack on our internal life you know can you just explain that a bit because i found that i know exactly what you mean but i think it'd be interesting for you to explain it a bit more yeah so i think this is one of the most important things about wokeness or political correctness or, or whatever we're meant to call it it's, it can be hard to define this culture but i think many people instinctively know what you're talking about yeah. when you talk about these things it's, it's kind of the authoritarianism with no name but people have a sense of what you mean i think one of the most important things about this culture is that it it, it actually wants to change how we think and so one of the arguments I make throughout the book, in, in most of the chapters, in fact, is that the key trend of our times is the manipulation of language to manipulate how we think, to change our actual minds and our thoughts. Mm -hmm. So on every issue from climate change, climate change is now referred to as climate emergency or climate mm -hmm. apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Those That is the manipulation of language designed to make us think that the end of the world is nigh, to, designed to limit what we can think on these issues. Or if you look at Islamist terrorism, police forces are now saying, let's call it faith claimed terrorism. Let's stop using words like jihadist and, and Islamic mm. and Islamist. Mm. Mm. That's And they openly say this is a way of changing how people think about community relations. Mm. And the same thing on the gender ideology. They will openly say that encouraging preferred pronoun use is about changing the way people think about sex and gender. That, again, is entirely Orwellian. George Orwell yeah. made the point that People who control language control thought. And that's the authoritarianism we are currently living under. And it is so important to push back against it because what it does, it's an invasion of our inner life. It's an invasion of our inner self. And, uh, you know, Stuart Lee, the comedian, once referred to political correctness as institutionalized politeness. He said it's mm. just about being polite. It's not about being polite. No, Since no. when did politeness involve being complicit in the lies of the establishment? Since yeah, when did yeah. polite... Be, mean saying things that you know are not true mm. in fact what political correctness is is institutionalized conformity yeah. and it's not actually enough in their eyes for us to be polite for mm. us to politely refer to a man who identifies as a woman as she that kind of politeness as they refer to it is not enough they want you to think of that man as a she and if mm. you don't they will call you a thought criminal so we've got to understand that this goes deeper even than freedom of speech this is an attack yeah, on freedom of yeah, conscience yeah. and and the an attack on the liberty of the mind and we yes. really need to stand up against that no I, I, beautifully put brandon i think it's absolutely right now the book um heretics manifesto essays on the unsayable is available in bookshops or amazon uh, Amazon, uh, it's in some bookshops. You can get it via the Spiked website as well. So, yeah, right. if you Google, people will yeah. find it. Well, look, all the very best with it, Brendan. Uh, I mean, I do hope next time you, when you, with your next book, you come back and talk about that. Um, but yeah. all the very best. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, hugely important book. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Peter. Um, that's it from the show this week, and we shall see you next time. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon 
so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.